This is the One Soldier Podcast, episode 22, with me, Russell Hillier. Here's a thought experiment I want you to try. It won't take long. Imagine I were to give you a pen and a paper and a list of all the constitutional and human rights that you enjoy simply because you were born in Canada. It would be a pretty long list, especially if we compare it to other places in the world. But as you're looking at that list, I'm going to start reading off these same rights and freedoms one at a time. And as I'm doing that, you're going to start crossing out the rights and freedoms on your list as you hear them called out by me. And as this is happening, I want you to ask yourself, where is the line? Where's the place where you put down your pen and pencil and say, that's it. That's where I would fight back. Is it before or after your mobility rights are taken away? Is it before or after your religious freedoms are gone? Is the line about your assembly rights taken away and arbitrary arrest? It's going to be extremely easy to say that you'd be that one guy, that one hair trigger that goes off at the first sign of authoritarianism. But guys, let's be honest. If you've been wearing a mask to the grocery store for the past year, then you're not that guy. In fact, if we're being honest about things, most of us deep down are going to know that we would not fight back at all no matter how bad it gets. And that's the scary lesson. If you look at history, there's a really good chance that in your lifetime, you will live in a situation, a time and a place where this isn't a theoretical question. And if you're lucky and you don't face this scenario, then it's almost guaranteed that your children will. So when do you fight back? When do you rebel? And that's my segue into today's topic of the 1885 Métis Rebellion. For the Métis, their line in the proverbial sand revolved around property rights as their homeland was annexed by the Canadian government. Their allies, the Cree and other Indian tribes, waited for that line in the sand. And they waited... And they waited some more before they finally and futilely fought back. But it was only when they were starving and disease-ridden, in no condition to offer much resistance. Nine years after the most infamous battle of the Little Bighorn, the 1885 Métis Rebellion was the last of the great Indian wars fought in North America. And we're going to look at this rebellion not from the native point of view, not from the Métis point of view, but from the perspective of a young officer named Lieutenant R.S. Castles of the Queen's Own Rifles, based out of Toronto. And his diary is, I think, one of the best primary sources available when learning about this historical event. And we're going to try to get into the mind of Castles and the Canadians who were sent west to punish the native insurrection on the Saskatchewan Prairie. So here we go. Diary entry number one. Monday, March 30th, 1885. Today at 12.15 p.m., we steam slowly away from Union Station, sadly parting from our many friends, but soon regaining cheerfulness at the thought that work lies before us. Much speculation is indulged in as the chances of the rebellion collapsing before we reach the Northwest and the general impression seems to be that it won't be necessary for us to pass Winnipeg. At 1 o'clock on Saturday morning, I am roused by the adjutant and told of the Duck Lake affair and notified that the regiment is called out. After that, one had no time to collect one's thoughts, scurrying from house to house during the night, warning the men, parading in the morning, and remaining in the drill shed till 2. Then when orders reach us that 250 men are required... But inspection discloses the fact that 23 extra men have smuggled themselves on board. 
if I can analyze my feelings about this affair, I come to the conclusion that I am very lucky to have the chance to go. Naturally, one feels a little troubled at leaving one's friends in this indefinite way. But change is pleasant, and one is sure to see something worth seeing. There's nothing more joyous in war as the road there too. Here's a couple things to note about this diary passage. First of all, Castles is like a lot of young men throughout history embarking to war. He's pumped. He's jacked. He's clearly not alone in this either. There was room for only 250 men from his reserve regiment to go west, but a close count reveals that 23 extra men have somehow found their way onto the train. And Castles himself reflects that he is amongst the lucky ones able to go to war. So in other words, morale is extremely high as these Canadians embark for war in the West. And this isn't some conscripted proletarian mass dragged from the gutters of Toronto and the fields of Upper Canada. These are men who want to be there. And if you're Sir John A. Macdonald or, or General Middleton or Colonel Otter, you've got to be pretty happy with that. Ask any soldier, and they'll tell you that morale is a tangible thing. It's real. It exists. And you need it to win. It's also worth noting that just days before departing from Toronto, news reaches that city and the rest of Canada of the Duck Lake affair. And the Duck Lake battle is it's the first engagement of the Métis Rebellion of 1885. There was a detachment of Northwest Mounted Police, led by a guy named Leif Crozier. They were trying to basically capture weapons and uh, ammo and munitions that the Métis were storing at Duck Lake. And they basically walked into an ambush. A lot of men killed. We talked about this a lot in episode four. Had uh, Gabriel Dumont gotten his way at Duck Lake, it would have been a massacre. And all the Canadian forces in that battle would have been killed. Riel inexplicably called off Gabriel Dumont, even though they had the Canadians on the run. He called him back and prevented what would probably have been a massacre. But as it stood, Crozier's force still sustained 25% casualties in that engagement, which only lasted about 30 minutes. Métis casualties were fairly light in comparison. Anyways, Castles and the rest of the men know about the defeat at Duck Lake. And you get that sense of revenge that seems to be spurring them on as well. Remember the Alamo, that famous Texan war cry. Well, remember Duck Lake. They're thinking about it. On their mind is revenge, retribution. Let's see what happens next. Now, the next few diary entries uh, takes place on a train ride throughout Northern Ontario. And... I'm not really going to get into any of those diary entries because they're a little bit monotonous. But the one thing to take note is that the Canadian forces sent west, well, they were able to reach Winnipeg in about a week. If we go back to the 1869 rebellion, it took the Canadian forces months to go from Upper Canada to Winnipeg uh, because there was no rail. Now there's a railway and that Canadian force is going to be able to be transported very quickly across Ontario, past Winnipeg, and into Saskatchewan. And those tracks, they just keep running all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And the speed of the mobilization is going to take Riel and his military commander Dumont by surprise. So now we're going to go back to the diary. Uh, but now it's April 7th. Castles and the company are in Winnipeg. They've gotten through Northern Ontario. Uh, they get a day or two to check out the city. A lot of people don't realize how important Winnipeg was to Canada at this time. In 1885, if you were to rank Canada's cities, it would probably be something like Montreal, Toronto, Halifax, and then Winnipeg in fourth place. It was the gateway to the West, sort of like a Northern Chicago. And with all due respect to Winnipeg in the year 2020, I don't think anybody would consider it to be, you know, the fourth most important city in Canada. Maybe I'm wrong, being biased in Alberta, but it's undeniable that Winnipeg was a much more important city at that time. So they get a couple days to check out the city. So here's the diary entry. 
The men all turn up in good time, charmed with Winnipeg and its inhabitants. Here they laugh at the idea of our having to do anything and say the people of Ontario are much more excited about this farcical rebellion than they are. The station is crowded with people anxious to see us off, and we depart about five amid the hearty cheers of the assembled crowd. This part's worth noting because, well, it seems the locals of Winnipeg, they don't have a very high regard for Louis Riel and the fighting spirit of the Métis. They call the rebellion farcical. They think it's going to be over soon. And basically, Upper Canada and the rest of Canada has gotten worked up about much ado about nothing. Well, we'll see about that. Back to the diary, Castle's, uh, they've left Winnipeg and they're heading west into Saskatchewan. Here's what Castle writes. Very soon we see before us the often heard of prairie and peculiar is the effect the first sight of it has. Miles and miles as far as the eye can reach of dreary yellow flatness. No bush, no tree, no house to break the monotonous dead level. We are told this is prairie at its worst, and we are willing to believe it. So Lieutenant Castle's first impression of the prairie landscape is not very good. He calls it dreary, miserable. Some people love the prairie, and other people not so much. It's no doubt a lot different than what castles would be used to in Ontario and Toronto. There are some charms, though, along the way, including the women of Brandon, Manitoba, which Castles writes about, just a little further down the line. Here's what he says. We reach Brandon and anxiously wait for the happy moment of arrival. It comes at last, but not till half past ten. It is too late, of course, to see anything of this, as we are told, very pretty place. We do have something to eat, however, because the cars are invaded by the sprightly damsels of the hamlet, armed with steaming jugs of coffee and bags of tempting cakes, and the delicacies aided by the charms of the fair donors, quite soften the hearts of our wax-warm warriors. Much necessary rapid flirtation is indulged in, the gay young major as usual distinguishing himself, the false and malicious designation of him as a married man by an envious rival having no effect on stopping his victorious career. A tour of the cars after Brandon is left behind shows that the boys have done fair execution. Ribbons that have doubtless figured in many a previous bun fight, handkerchiefs that have certainly seen better days, wave now triumphantly on many an unaccustomed manly bosom. I love this part. It's classic boys being boys. Anytime you mix young men with women and drinks, well, there's going to be a good time, and that's what seems to happen on this train car. And... I love the part where someone tries to cock block the young major by saying that he's married. He's not married, but uh, anyways, it seems like he has a, what Castle says, victorious career with uh, the young damsel. Whatever that means, I'll leave that to your imagination. Okay, so now we're at the point where Castles has disembarked at a place called Capel in Saskatchewan. Back to the diary, this is Thursday, April 9th. Here's what he says. The morning dawns bright and clear, and soon genial warmth dispels the gloom and stiffness of the night. A hasty breakfast is indulged in, and then all hands are ordered out for drill, skirmishing the chief attraction. The grenadiers arrive in the morning, but are pushed on at once to join the general, leaving Capel in wagons. So the soldiers are finally getting to do some training for the fight. And what's prescient here is that they are training in skirmishing tactics. For hundreds of years prior, and you know this, soldiers would line up in ranks, march towards the enemy, deploy in a line, and then trade volley fire with the enemy. As recently as 20 years previous to 1885 in the American Civil War, this is how it was done. I mean, yeah, there was, there was a little bit of trench warfare, but... By and large, the main battles are their set piece, the lines moving across fields, and, and fighting in those closed ranks. 
And then 15 years later, during the Boer War, the British troops routinely advanced on Boer positions in South Africa in the same way, through open ground, and they suffered thousands of casualties in the opening months of that war. But in this war, something different is happening. The Canadians will be fighting as skirmishers, which gives them a level of autonomy to each soldier. Instead of marching shoulder to shoulder with the man beside you, you get to move independently now. You get to spread out, take cover, fire as necessary. And when you move in this way, you become a much more difficult target. This is how the Indians and the Métis are going to fight. And so the Canadians are wisely adopting these new tactics to fight in this land, in this new modern era with modern weaponry. Because the Métis, they're not using muskets, they're using rifles. And you can kill a man from a long distance with a rifle. And this new tactic, well, it's going to serve them well. Now, further on in the same entry, we read about this outfit called Bolton Scouts. Here we go. We see Bolton Scouts, the Cowboy Brigade as it's called. They dress in white helmets and brown duck shooting jackets, corduroys and tops, and a very serviceable looking set they are. Most of them we find are young Englishmen. The vast majority of the Canadian force is on foot. It's infantry. They have to walk or take wagons everywhere. The Métis and the Indians, on the other hand, they're mounted on horses, which gives them a mobility advantage. The Canadians do, though. They have this one unit called Bolton Scouts, which are local men. It's like a militia, sort of like the Northern Texas Rangers, I guess you could say. And they know the land because they're from there. And more importantly, they're mounted just as the Métis are, and they're going to be the eyes and the ears of the army. It should be noted that the namesake of the unit, Charles Arcall Bolton, led a similar unit of militia in the first Métis Rebellion, and unfortunately for him, he basically led them all into a trap where they were all captured. So hopefully he can redeem himself in this second rebellion. Moving back to the diary, here's uh, part of the entry for Friday, April 10th. Last night was again bitterly cold. It seems impossible to keep warm and sleep is a mere farce. We now each have a double and a single blanket, but this seems to be quite insufficient to engender any warmth in our miserable, shivering carcasses. The morning is bright and warm, and a brisk bout of skirmishing pulls us together. Castles and the rest of the men, they hear skirmishing for the first time, which means that somewhere close by there is low-intensity fighting happening. Probably Métis scouts and Canadian sentries taking a couple pot shots at each other. Nothing too serious, but it gets the men going and it gives them a taste of what's to come. And you can imagine that this is going to get Castle's blood pumping because now he's realizing that they're in the enemy territory now. They're in enemy country. It's not fun and games anymore. Castle's command is now at a place called Swift Current. And I'm going to go back to the diary. So we're at Saturday, April 11, 1885. We enjoy a night of warmth and comfort in the cars and pitch camp in the early morning close to the railway. Sea School, that's the, the name of the company, have taken up their quarters in the station. Swift Current is a very small place, merely a railway depot, in fact, with a few stores and houses. A few days ago, the place was raided by Indians who helped themselves to anything and everything that pleased them. The country is very wretched near here. No wood or water. Water for drinking purposes is brought in by tanks by rail from Calgary, 300 miles to the west. Camps here waiting for us are about 100 mounted police under Colonel Hirchmer. And we now learn definitively that our destination is Battleford. That place is almost due north and about 200 miles distant. The trip there is not likely to be pleasant. We bring with us from Capel some 50 wagons and the necessary number of horses. These teams will carry our supplies. And just to give some historical context, originally General Middleton, who was the overall commander of the Canadian force, he wanted to take the entire Canadian contingent up the South Saskatchewan River Valley to capture the Métis capital at Batoche by overwhelming numbers. However, 
He was forced to divert about a thousand men under the command of Colonel Otter to march further west to Battleford. And the reason for this is that Chiefs Big Bear and Poundmaker had turned hostile. There was the Frog Lake Massacre where all the white men in that community were killed, including the priest. And that was done by Big Bear's men. Uh, we talk a lot about that in episode four. And then we have Chief Poundmaker. He's raiding and burning down villages and forts in his area. So Castles is going to be attached to Colonel Otter's wing of the army with the goal of relieving Battleford, where hundreds of settlers were now taking refuge while also punishing Chief Big Bear and Chief Poundmaker. All right, back to the diary. Same entry. After dinner, we have battalion drill. And when this is over... Harry and I have a grand run of some six or seven miles over the prairie. We see numbers of buffalo skulls and try our revolvers at these very enticing targets, but we see none of the living animals. Best estimates are that there were 50 million buffalo on the North American plains at one time, and then that number shrank down to about 100, preserved by a very forward-looking rancher in Montana. And the disappearance of the buffalo was due almost entirely to overhunting, and it completely devastated the Plains Indian way of life in America and Canada. And it's, I think, a lesson that history changes slowly, almost imperceptibly slow for 99% of the time, and then it changes really, really fast for that last 1%. One year there are millions of buffalo, and the next, they're all gone. Because had castles been in this exact same location only 10 years prior, there would have been tens of thousands of buffalo, there would have been Indians living traditional lifestyles, and no white people at all. And then you fast forward just 10 years, and it's completely different. The buffalo are gone. There's a railway, there's towns, hotels, uh, white settlers, and the Indians no longer masters of this land, forced onto reserves where they lived in an impoverished and near famine-like existence. It happens quickly. Back to the diary, Sunday, 12th April, 1885. Early this morning, Colonel Otter comes up from Capel, and with him came B Battery of the Guards, also Captain Howard of the United States Militia, and in his charge, two Gatling guns. These curious implements of destruction we inspect with interest, and their trial is watched eagerly. A few rounds are fired at some duck on a distant pond. No execution is done, apparently, but the rapidity of the fire shows us how very deadly a weapon of this kind might be on proper occasions, and we want now to see one tried on the Indians. From what we hear... They have seemed to have definitely risen, and we shall probably have some hard work before they are quieted again. The Gatling gun is at this time a new invention of war. You can think of it as a hand-cranked proto-machine gun which can fire a few hundred rounds a minute. Also listen to the words Castle uses. He says the Indians have risen. And that is a fairly common verbiage to describe the ever-present fear amongst settlers and government that the Indians were going to leave the reserves and go on the warpath. Okay, I'm going to fast forward a few days, and now we're at Tuesday, 14th April. Here we go. Last night we slept without disturbance, and today start at 6.30 in the morning in the cold gray dawn and make a fairly good stretch of 18 miles. As soon as the sun rises, the men find marching hard work, and wary warm and way worn, we gladly reach the welcome banks of the Saskatchewan River. Near the river, we pass through a wonderful defile, winding in a most extraordinary way through steep sandy hills. Trouble was feared here, but fortunately we get through without molestation. We also pass today a deserted Indian encampment, and here we see buried, so to speak, but really just fastened to the branch of a small tree, a little Indian baby. So they're passing through some uh, some rough terrain, it seems, and they're fearful of ambush around every coulee, every ravine, uh, which does, at this point in time, it does not come to pass. But they do find evidence that the Indians are close by. They find the Indian encampment, which is abandoned, and the dead Indian child. 
back to that same entry. At the river, we meet the police once more. They came here ahead of us a day or two ago to see if the coast was clear and we are to act as scouts in the future. At the river, we meet the police once more. They came here ahead of us a day or two ago to see if the coast was clear and are to act as scouts in the future. They have with them one of the famous mountain howitzers, a very handy looking little gun it is. A brass seven pounder and weighing only carriage and all some 400 pounds. So we've got the Canadians, they've got the Gatling guns and they've got the howitzers that are going to try to, and if they can bring these new modern weapons platforms to bear on the Métis and the Indians, then, well, they're going to have a tough time. Back to the same diary entry. Towards dusk, much excitement is caused by the announcement that some figures can be seen on one of the distant hills, and we at once conclude that our Indian friends are taking observations, as there are no settlers in this part of the country. The gallant captain and senior subaltern of number one form themselves into a reconnoitering party and make a bold sally and approach the disturbers. And it is found that they are nothing more than certain teamsters who have wandered somewhat too far from camp. Teamsters are very objectionable and under certain circumstances, especially if taken internally, are absolutely fatal. But when kept at a reasonable distance, are not immediately dangerous. Therefore, we can't feeling comparatively secure. So Teamsters, they, I don't know, I guess you could say they're like the, they're the sailors of the prairie. Uh, not a good reputation. So it's at this juncture where Colonel Otter has to transport his portion of the army over the South Saskatchewan River. So back to the diary. Now we're at Wednesday, 15 April, 1885. We walk down to the river and watch with interest the process of transporting supplies to the North Bank. Slow as the progress made. The river, the south branch of the Saskatchewan, is here some 300 yards wide and as its name, Swift Current, denotes extremely rapid. A steamer has been brought to the crossing and is actively engaged in making passages across, but each trip consumes much time. The steamer itself, the Northcote, is a most peculiar craft. It is in fact merely an immense flat-bottomed scow. She draws only two feet of water, with a little machinery and some cabins. A large wheel at the stern is the propelling instrument. The current and the wind render steering a very difficult task, and we are told that if the wind rises much more, as it threatens to do, the operations will have to be suspended. Interestingly enough, the Métis were able to cripple this same steamer, the Northcote, by what they did was they lowered a cable across the river which destroyed the ship's smokestack and disabled the craft. But yeah, a, a very uh, peculiar incident of some, I don't know, proto-naval warfare in the middle of the prairies. Not exactly what you would expect. And this part's interesting. I'm going to go back to the diary here. So Friday, April 17th. We now have a large number of Teamsters with us, some 200 in all. They look upon the rebellion as a godsend, for it means hard cash to them. They get from 5 to $6 a day, and fair as this price is, the unfortunate government has to pay 8 and $10 the difference being pocketed by the contractors. So it's several times in this diary, Castles displays a very negative opinion of the Teamsters as being these like greedy, unreliable, cowardly, and selfish people. And the Teamsters are, of course, they're the guys in charge of driving the wagons with all the army supplies. And yeah, they seem to be a bit of a shady bunch. Okay, now we're getting into the next day, Saturday, April 18th. We're getting closer to the conflict, the actual battles in this rebellion. So here we go. Tonight we begin to realize that we are in enemy country. As we, for the first time, form a logger. The wagons are placed in an open square, each face about 200 paces long. The horses are tethered in the inside and the tents pitched on the outside, doors opening towards the wagons. The men are ordered to sleep with their arms beside them and at the first alarm to make for the wagons. Then their position would be a happy one. A fierce enemy in front and frantic struggling mules and horses more dangerous still behind. We also have tonight a countersign, our first experience. It's called Gopher. 
Gopher is the word chosen, and very suitable the choice is. The gopher seems to be the sole representative of four-footed life in this country. The prairie is honeycombed with their holes. Arraying their wagons in this uh, square shape, uh, well, very common in warfare. Even happens today. I mean, if you talk to, I just had a Chuck Perdonic on the podcast a couple weeks ago, a veteran of Afghanistan, and he was talking about how Canadian soldiers and British and Americans too would take the same precautions of sort of arraying their vehicles in these uh, circle or square shapes as protective barriers against the enemy. And then you basically, you've got a, uh, well, you've got a fort. And it's a portable one that you can take with you. All right, back to the diary. Thursday, April 21. A courier catches us tonight and brings us news of the Fort Pitt disaster and gives a bad account of the state of affairs at Battleford. We become more anxious than ever if that was possible to press on. Fort Pitt was a police fort that was abandoned by the police after being surrounded and given an ultimatum by Big Bear's tribe where the wily old Indian chief hints at a massacre, basically saying to the the police garrison and the settlers in that fort that if you don't leave, if you don't surrender the fort, well, I might not be able to control my warriors, so you better get out now. And that's exactly what happens. The Canadians surrender the fort, and it is ransacked by Big Bear's tribe. And so if your castles, you've heard of Fort Pitt and the Duck Lake defeat, the Frog Lake massacre, there's been some skirmishing. It's getting a little hot on the prairie right now, and it's only going to get worse. Now on podcast episode four, where I look at could Louis Riel have won this thing? One of the the questions that, or one of the things that I suggest in that podcast is that the Métis and their Indian allies, they could have given themselves a much greater chance of success and ultimate victory if they had focused on harassing Middleton and Otter's columns along their passes of march because these Canadian forces, they're in territory that they're not familiar with. Uh, you could, they could hit the supply routes sort of sting them and harry them along the way, exhaust them by the time they get to their destination. I think if Louis Riel and and Dumont had done more of that, it would have paid off. Here's an example of what I mean. Here we go. Wednesday, 22 April. On duty last night, and of course, no sleep. Another sentry distinguishes himself and fires at what he stoutly asserts to be a man on horseback. Nothing comes of it. We start about half past five and hurry on at a tremendous pace. The country is very hilly and broken, and at about eight miles out we come to a belt of thick scrub. Trouble is feared here, and two companies are ordered out as skirmishers. I go with one, but the scouts come back and report all is clear, and we drop back quickly into place. We have a very short halt, and then press on again. About five shots are suddenly heard towards the head of the column, and all is excitement. Our skirmishers are ordered to the front, and after a tremendous double, we reach a piece of rising ground and see in the distance a number of Indians making north as fast as their ponies can carry them. Our scouts have had quite a little skirmish, wounded one Indian and captured a wagon, some ponies and blankets. We camp soon after this occurrence and prepare to keep a sharp lookout. Fortunately, we are in a very favorable position. No hills or woods near us. This is how you grind down a larger force operating in hostile territory. As mounted infantry, Riel's forces were perfectly suited to the job of hit-and-run tactics that could sting and slow down and exhaust the Canadian Army. Like a cloud of hornets, they aren't going to kill you, but swatting at them is going to wear you out. And it's going to tire you and demoralize you, and then by the time that you reach the field of battle, you're worn out. You're not in fighting condition. And there was a little bit of this happening, but if you're the Métis, it's not enough. Okay, I'm going to go back to the diary now. Otter's column is getting closer to Battleford, the relief of that town which is under siege, where all the settlers are taking shelter. There's some policemen there defending the fort. Here's what Castles writes about as they're approaching Battleford. So back to the diary, April 23rd, 1885. We have 
an early start and make good progress. All the men ride. In the afternoon, I am obliged at last to ride too. We are going downhill and through Indian reserves, and it would never do to be left behind. We make only 30 miles, however, halting quite early in the afternoon, about two miles from Battleford. This afternoon, we see houses again and find that we have reached the reserve of the Stonies. We see, among others, the houses of Payne and Tremant, two of the Indian instructors, both of whom have been murdered. Payne married a squaw and was a good friend to the people he taught, but they took his life at the first opportunity. So much for Indian gratitude. In one of the Indian houses, our scouts find a squaw, dead, with a bullet through her head. She is painted in full war paint and may have been killed in some of the skirmishes near Battleford. No one is to be seen on the reserve. Men, women, and children are all off on the war path. The Stonies are Sioux Indians and bear a very unenviable reputation. And why is that? Why do the Stonies and the Sioux bear an unenviable reputation? Well, think back nine years prior, 1876, the Little Bighorn, that most infamous of all massacres where General Custer and his 7th Cavalry was decimated at the hands of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. A lot of people don't realize this, but after the battle, Sitting Bull took his band of Sioux Indians into Saskatchewan as they evaded American pursuit, and he stayed in Canada for some years. In fact, some of the Sioux Indians stayed in Canada permanently. Chief Sitting Bull did go back to America eventually and was killed. Uh, some of his people, though, stayed in Saskatchewan. Now, most of Real's allies in this rebellion are Cree warriors from Big Bear and Poundmakers tribes, but there are some others as well, uh, like these Stony Indians that Castles is writing about. And it's these Stonies, these Sioux, that are synonymous with the Indian Wars in America. You have to wonder, what, one of the great what-ifs of this rebellion is, what if these Sioux warriors had thrown in their lot with Riel in greater numbers? Now keep in mind, these, these are warriors who know how to fight. They were at the Bighorn, many of them. They, were with, they rode with Crazy Horse and with Sitting Bull. They know how to fight. They've scalped American cavalrymen. They've won in battle. These are veterans. You could not find a more hardened group of warriors on all the prairies. These veterans of the American Indian Wars. And what if they had thrown in their lot with Riel in greater numbers? Some of them did, but just imagine what a few hundred more veterans from the Little Bighorn could have done at Fish Creek or Batosh or Cut Knife Hill. Could have been a very different war. Okay, back to the diary, the same entry. We can see Battleford about eight miles away from a height of land and are disgusted to notice clouds of smoke rising from the settlement. We are ordered to camp, however, much as we would like to press on and render help if help be needed. It is not considered advisable to advance when night is approaching. The scouts, however, go on to make investigations. In the evening, shots are heard from the direction of the town, and 25 of the mounted police start off to see what the trouble is. Leslie goes with them. They came back all right, and report that the scouts exchanged a few shots with some odd Indians, but that the main body, who have been besieging the town, have departed. Before leaving, they set fire to Judge Rouleau's house as a last mark of defiance, and this was the building we saw burning. It was a house on the south side of the Battle River. The main settlement is on the north side and is still safe, and the people have been made aware of our approach. One of the garrison was, we hear, killed last night while on picket duty. So remember, Colonel Otter's mission is to relieve Battleford, which is essentially under siege from the Indians, but they seem to take off when Otter's column approaches. And so although there will be skirmishing in the vicinity of Battleford for the next few weeks, but the main Indian body has 
withdrawn further to avoid the approach of Otter's men. And Castles is going to give a description of what Battleford looks like upon his arrival. So now we're at Friday, 24th April, 1885. Going back to the diary. Here's what Castles says. We halt on the high ground overlooking the Battle River while the brigadier and staff cross the river and enter the fort. They return before long and give a graphic account of the welcome they have received from the poor people who have been besieged here and in terror of their lives for the last six weeks. We are told that we are to stay where we are for the present and camp is pitched on an open space near a large building, now or rather lately used as an industrial school. It was formerly we hear the government house and is quite a palace in a country like this. After the tents are pitched, we are able to go about and take observations, and then the extent of the ravages committed become apparent. On this side of the river, there were originally some dozen houses and two or three stores forming what is called the Old Town. Four or five of these houses have been burned, the others dismantled and pillaged, and the stores completely gutted. Scarcely anything has escaped. What could not be taken has been destroyed. About us we see scattered in dismal confusion, feathers, photos, books, tins, furniture, and desolation reigns supreme. The Indians have, we hear, been holding high carnival here for some weeks. They were out of rifle shot from the fort and shells were too precious to be often sent at them. Each night an attack was expected, but beyond firing at the men drawing water from the Battle River, they molested the garrison but little. So, Battleford had a, a rough go in, in this rebellion, under siege for quite some time. The Indians, not powerful enough to take the town by, by force, but, but definitely strong enough to keep up a screen, uh, a siege, which uncomfortable for the inhabitants and deadly too. So at this point, I think I'm going to skip through a couple of entries and we're going to go right to May 1st, 1885 and the Battle of Cutknife Hill where Colonel Otter's column of around 350 men engages, finally, Poundmaker's force of roughly the same number of mostly Cree warriors. Now, Otter was told by Middleton to stay in Battleford and guard the town. But he gets a little impetuous and he decides to take this flying column into the hills to chastise and punish Poundmaker. So this is, it's a lengthy description of the battle, but I'm going to start reading right now. Friday, 1st May, 1885. Last night was extremely cold and raw, this morning bright and warm. We are ordered to be ready to leave this afternoon for the front and spend the morning getting things in shape. The object of the expedition is we here to make a reconnaissance. It is not thought that there will be any fighting to do, and if there is, Poundmaker has we here only 200 men and ought not to be able to do very much. The brigadier and staff evidently think that Poundmaker will surrender if we get near him at all. So the Canadians under Otter, they're working under an assumption which will prove to be false, that Poundmaker is not ready to fight and that if they even get close to him, he's going to run away. Back to that diary entry. About 4 p.m., the column starts. Our force is eight scouts, 60 mounted police under Captain Neal, Battery 8 under Major Short, C School Company, 45 men, Number 1 Company, Queen's Own Rifles, the Battleford Rifles, and Castles is going to give a, a complete order of battle, which I'm going to skip over for sake of time. Back to the diary entry. We climbed the hill and had breakfast and rest the horses before pushing on. The stream proved to be rather hard to cross. After crossing it, we had some 500 yards of scrubby marshy lands to go through, and then we began to climb a hill. The scouts were riding quietly near the guns. The men had dismounted and were walking by twos and threes along the trail. When suddenly, just as the scouts reached the top of the first steep ascent, I heard a rattle of rifles ahead, and then in a minute or two saw the police and some artillery lying down, firing briskly over the crest of the hill, and the guns and Gatling guns all working for all they were worth. At the same time, bullets began to fly around us, and puffs of smoke floated from the bushes on the right and left. 
showed us where they came. Evidently, we were in a trap. So the way Castles is describing things, he says quite plainly they've walked into a trap, an ambush, which the enemy has set up. And the enemy, in this case, Poundmakers, Cree warriors, they've concealed themselves on three sides, which is exactly how the Indians want to fight against the Canadians. Anytime there's a battle, there's going to be chaos and confusion. One guy's going to say that this happened and another guy's going to say that that happened. Castles, in this next part of the diary entry, he's going to tell us that he's only going to write about exactly what he saw in his immediate vicinity. So let's keep going back to the diary. The men fortunately had their rifles in their hands, and it was the work of a very few moments to form up and take the positions and slide into us. And this was the situation. Roughly speaking, we occupied a triangular, inclined plain, the apex resting on the creek and the base running along the crest of the hill. In front of the hill and parallel to the crest was a ravine about 200 yards distant. And running down from this ravine on each side of us and in a direction pretty nearly parallel to the sides of the triangle was another ravine. On the far side of the ravine, on the right there was open ground, but on the left for a long distance the whole country was rolling and bushy and it was from this side that the heaviest firing seemed to come from. C School Company was ordered to protect the right flank and clear the ravine on that side, while to the Queen's own and guards were assigned a similar duty on the left. The Battleford men were to look after the rear. The police and artillery were busily engaged in front. This was at 5.15 a.m., as to what happened after that, except in my own immediate vicinity, I know nothing but hearsay. I saw no more of the guards, no more of the Battleford rifles and our fellows till we were on our way home. So that's Castles just making it clear that he's only going to talk about what he saw. Back to the diary. For half an hour we had quite hot enough work and the bullets came flying about us in not over pleasant manner. We were exposed to fire from three sides and had to grin and bear it. After half an hour or so, we had quite silenced any fire on the right, that is our immediate front, and could easily keep the ravine clear as the Indians could not reach it without exposing themselves, and this they never dared to do. Colonel Otter asking how things were and being told this ordered Mr. Woodmore to take the men up to the front and reinforce the line there. And at the same time, he asked me to take a couple of men and carry some ammunition to the fighting line. While doing this, I had a chance of seeing how things were going on. The wagons I found were formed in a square in a dip in the ground. The horses fastened to them, and the mounted police horses formed in a corral a short distance from the wagons. So far, no men near me had been hit, but I heard the cry of ambulance several times, though too busy to notice particularly where or why the cry was raised. Now sad to say, I saw only too well why the bears were needed. A small square was formed with wagons, and here Strange and Leslie were busily engaged. Several poor fellows were lying there that needed no further looking after, but others were having wounds bound up and being made as comfortable as possible. And so when Castle says these, these people who don't need any more help, well, he's saying that they're dead. Back to the diary. We get the ammunition and carrying it across the exposed space as quickly as possible and reach the guns and the front of the line. Here the fighting is still hot and several men are hit, but gradually the fire in our front slackens, the bullets come in any quantity only from the left. There the Queen's own are evidently having plenty of work. The rattle of rifles is unceasing. Where I am, the Gatling gun is worked whenever there appears to be a chance, and every now and then the guns throw a shell or two at the enemy. Unfortunately, we have with us the mounted police guns, the small howitzers, and they prove to be utter failures. In the first place, they are not heavy enough, and in the second place, they are not even in working order. After the first few shots, the trails went into pieces, and before any further shots could be fired, the gun has to be fastened as best it could with ropes. Very little could be done with guns in this condition, but all that could be done was done by Major Short and Captain Rutherford. Their pluck and coolness was in striking contrast to the miserable, skulking spirit shown by the French-Canadian gunners who funked decidedly 
and were of no use whatever. A couple interesting parts here. When I had Tim Bax of the Sailor Scouts on uh, Veteran of the Rhodesian War, he made a point about talking of insurgencies. And what he said that I remember was that it's difficult to find an enemy insurgent. But when you do, if you can bring your modern weapon platforms to bear, you'll win the battle. The Canadians, in this case, they have found Poundmaker's men. They've got their modern weapon platforms, the Gatling guns, the, the big heavy artillery. But they're of no use. Castles talks about how the artillery is an utter failure. It's not made for these conditions. And so if you're the Cree Indians, well, this is a good thing. Because these modern weapons that the Canadians have brought to the field of battle, they're of no use. And so now you're fighting on a bit more equal terms. Especially when you've chosen the ground. Also worth noting, and I think a lot of Canadians can relate to this, English-French animosity. Castles goes out of his way to say that the French-Canadian gunners are, he uses the, the term funked. I think what he's trying to say here is that they are, they're skulking, uh, they're, they're being cowardly, they're not doing their job. And so there's this like competition, this animosity between the French and the English, which resonates with Canadians even today. Now, some of this might be due to the fact that the French Canadians were very sympathetic to Riel and the Métis because they shared a language, they shared the Roman Catholic religion. There's a very good chance that some of these men on both sides would have been related in some way because, of course, the Métis are the descendants of French fur trading men and native women. So there's a lot of cultural bonds. And so maybe the French Canadians, maybe their heart isn't in this fight the same way that the English are. Let's go back to the diary now. Major Short and one or two of the men worked one gun by themselves and made some beautiful long shots at the teepees which could be seen about a thousand yards away. And at a group of horsemen who supposed they were all out of danger. I stayed near the guns for a considerable time till Colonel Otter and Colonel Hirschmer decided that we could not advance and must retire. This was at about 11. The fire of the enemy seemed to be almost completely silenced, but it was thought that we could not advance without great loss through the broken country in front of us and in the face of an evidently numerous foe. The wagons and guns were to be taken across the creek and the Gatling artillery and Sea School company were to stay on the hill to cover the retreat. I ran across to rejoin Sea School and were now on the right front and gave Mr. Woodmore the order. I found that while I had been away, a poor fellow had been shot dead, having been hit in three places as he raised himself to fire. Between half past 11 and 12, we got the order to retire. And then came the most trying part of the day. We had got about 300 yards from the crest of the hill before the Indians knew what was up and appeared on it. But then a heavy fire opened up on us and mighty hard work it was walking quietly down with the bullets whistling by. The men behaved, however, with great coolness and steadiness and the artillery and ourselves retired alternately 50 yards or so at a time, then halted and kept up a steady fire. The Gatling was now near the creek and open on the Indians and Captain Rutherford sent some shells amongst them and from the far side, they evidently felt they had had enough. They did not attempt to follow us past the creek and this we crossed quietly, the men with admirable coolness each waiting is turned across the stream by a log that lays across it and refusing to gain time by wading through the water. Across the creek, we found everything prepared for a start and we got in our wagons without delay and made off. So retreating in good order is generally thought of as being the most difficult command to carry out in warfare. And there's good reason for this. And we see it happening in this diary entry. So number one, when the enemy knows you've had enough, they're going to start pushing harder, trying to turn your retreat into a rout. And we can see that's exactly what's happening here. The Cree warriors, they can see the Canadians starting to fall back across this creek. And you can just imagine them crossing this log across a creek. How precarious is that? The Indian warriors see this happening and they think this is our chance and they, they make a rush for the guns. It doesn't work, but 
if they were to have a, an even greater victory on this day, that's where it would have happened. Secondly, it's very challenging to maintain discipline and order in a retreat because that's when panic starts to set in and it takes just one man or one group of men to start the stampede for everything to fall apart. Think back to the episode I did with Peter Vronsky and the, the Fenian invasion and the Battle of Ridgeway. The entire Canadian army in 1866 was routed, stampeded from the field in just such a scenario. And a retreating army is a vulnerable army. And what Otter is doing is conducting a staged retreat where different lines and units are moving back 50 yards at a time to get back across the creek. And it's ultimately a successful withdrawal. Let's go back to the diary. I was very much rejoiced to find Hume and my other particular friends safe. All agreed that number one company had behaved magnificently. Colonel Otter saying they fought like tigers. But strange to say, they had not lost a man, though six had been wounded. Our total loss was six killed outright and 18 wounded. And of these, two cannot possibly live, while two or three others are in very dangerous condition. Now here, Castles is going to uh, do some reflection on the battle. I did not feel afraid exactly, but I certainly did feel that it would be much nicer to be somewhere else. After a time when other fellows were struck and I continued to escape, I felt as if I should get through all right and did not think about the danger. Our ambulance corps came in for great praise for their conduct. They seemed to be always on hand when needed and exposed themselves with the greatest pluck. None of them were hit, though narrow escapes were frequent. One man shows his cap with two bullet holes through it. Another has a button cut from his tunic. The coat of a third is ripped across his back by a ball, and so on. Other marvelous escapes are heard of. Major Short has lost the gold braid from one side of his forge cap. Fraser from F Company has his hair ruffled and his scalp grazed. Mikkel is just touched on the temple, and so on. I was not touched and had no such decidedly near shave as these, but one bullet struck the earth a few inches from my head and was quite as close as was pleasant. Another ball came whistling by me and buried itself with a sickening thud. So I thought into the next man beside me, about a foot away. I turned expecting to see him knocked over, but his helmet only had suffered. At one time I was lying down with my sword resting on my hip and shining brightly in the sun, and some fellow evidently saw this and fired three shots at me. The last time he very nearly had me, and I quietly adjourned. The fellows say Akison and Lloyd behaved very well, carrying in a wounded man under heavy fire, Lloyd himself being wounded while doing this. Early in the day, the Indians made a rush for the guns and nearly had them. The artillery fell back at first, but were rallied and drove the Redskins back. Here's where Castles actually gives a description of what the Indian warriors look like. Back to the diary. They are horrible looking fellows, these Indians are, and they fought in a way that surprised the police who have been accustomed to look upon them as errant cowards. They are the beau ideal of skirmishers, expose themselves but little, and move with marvelous quickness. Frequently they would show a blanket or some article of attire to draw our fire, and then pot at the unfortunate individual who had exposed themselves. One or two of the dead I examined. They had nothing on but a shirt and leggings and a blanket over their shoulder. Their hair is long and plaited, and the faces and bodies painted most ferocious-looking wretches. So Castles, he, he has this dichotomy when it comes to looking at the, the native warriors. On the one hand, he's impressed. He, he admits they're good fighters, they're good soldiers. On the other side of that dichotomy is the disgust, the lack of civilization so apparent in their war paint and their plated hair and their appearance. Back to the diary. The place where the fight took place is known as Cut Knife Hill, and it is an ancient battleground of the Crees. Here they fought a desperate battle with the Blackfeet and drove them from the country. The second victory on this ground will cause them to regard themselves as heroes invincible. So Castles admitting that uh, the Canadians did not win on this day. Back to the diary. 
It is too bad to think that we have had to retire, but though we have retreated, I think we have given a good deal more than we got. The Indians have evidently been pretty well punished, or they would certainly not have allowed us to return undisturbed. The men were full of fight, but terribly tired, and with an exhausted force and disabled guns, it was considered too risky to press on. A great mistake it was not to take our field guns. In this, as in many other matters, we have been deceived. We were told that the country was quite impassable for heavy guns, and we found that, though not without difficulty, we could have brought them. Then we have been altogether deceived as to the strength and intentions of the Indians. However, it cannot be helped, and we must only hope for better luck next time. So here Castles is doing some uh, some armchair generalship. Maybe that's not fair because he was actually there. But he, he's reflecting on the mistakes that were made. They should have brought the heavy guns for one. He also mentions the deception as to the, the numbers of the Indian enemies. More numerous than they had supposed and also much more willing to fight. But Castles is saying that he thinks they could have carried the day if they had just pushed on a little further. Here's the next day. May 3rd, 1885. Two poor fellows died this morning. They have been quite unconscious since they were struck, both shot through the head. I was very sorry to see poor little Winder among the dead. He is a young English fellow, a gentleman, very bright and good looking. He was the last man struck and had just taken a rifle too, to have a shot at the beggars before driving his horses off. But most of the Teamsters behaved very badly. They were not expected to fight, but they would not even drive their teams where they were told. Castles writes, everything quiet last night. Today, beautiful, bright, and warm. We, this morning, bury our dead. The graves are dug in a quiet spot on the banks of the Saskatchewan, and we lay our comrades there side by side. One of the killed was a Roman Catholic, and a separate service is held for him. Then we have the English service. Fire the three volleys and sadly depart. It was certainly the most solemn burial. One realizes what a serious and sudden thing such death is, and we wonder when and where the next man's turn may come. I'm going to skip ahead now to uh, May 14th, 1885. Colonel Otter and the rest of his column have been licking their wounds in Battleford, in Fort Otter. There's been some skirmishing, but it's been relatively quiet. Here's what Castle says. We have an exciting day. One of the mail carriers comes in this morning and tells us that some 15 miles away, he met a number of teamsters riding south as fast as their horses would carry them. Some 20 teams on their way here had been attacked by Indians, and only five or six of the men escaped. The courier very pluckily came on and got in safely, though he was seen and pursued. Shortly after this, some five or six mounted police ride in hurriedly and tell us that they were fired upon some six miles away when out on patrol duty and have, sad to say, lost one man killed and one wounded. This comes from our enforced inaction. The general has persistently refused to allow us to move against Poundmaker again, and he being undisturbed has become bold once more. So Castles is saying that the command has come down, that they've got to stay in Battleford. They can't go after Poundmaker again. And so this reprieve is making Poundmaker and his warriors less cautious and has emboldened them to start skirmishing and sniping again. Back to the diary, 15th May. A party of scouts and police go out today to the scene of yesterday's disaster. They find the body of the policeman killed yesterday wrapped carefully in canvas and decently buried. Most unusual respect to the dead to be shown by Indians. We learn from the scouts that the Indians camped about six miles away last night and are now apparently working fast. The supply train captured yesterday was a small and not important one, but the next time we may not be so lucky. Perhaps now an escort will be sent when the supply trains are needed and a proper guard capped at the halting places. We hear of one station where one solitary man is in charge and there are stored thousands of boxes of beef and biscuit and more valuable still a great many rifles and much ammunition. This is a station only some 40 miles away and easily within reach of the niches and I have not heard this term before niches though given the context it seems to be some kind of derogatory term for the native warriors 
Poundmaker is eventually brought to heel. He comes into the lines on May 26. Here's what Castles writes. Just after breakfast, the lookout sentry reports that two horsemen are coming in, and these turn out to be an Indian and a half-breed who report that Poundmaker is just behind. Colonel Williams, who just at this time rides up, takes charge of the Indian, and gallops off with him to report to the general. Soon we see a band of horsemen approaching rapidly, and before long the renowned chief appears before us. Captain Brown is unfortunately at the brigade office, but Captain Hughes and myself received the braves at the gate of our fortress with becoming dignity. Poundmaker is accompanied by some 15 sub-chiefs and counselors, and the appearance of the band is very picturesque and striking. The great chief himself is a very remarkable looking man, tall, very handsome and intelligent looking and dignified to a degree. He wears a handsome war cap made of the head of a cinnamon bear with a long tuft of feathers floating from it, a leather jacket studded with brass nails and worked with beads, long beaded leggings coming up to his hips and brightly colored moccasins while over his shoulders hangs a very gaily colored blanket. The others are dressed in much the same manner and all are elaborately painted. Poundmaker shakes hands with us without dismounting or uncovering, but all the others get off their horses and take off their caps before they approach us. After a short talk, we send the party on to the general, and when Captain Brown comes back here from him, an account of the powwow between the chiefs and our commander. The scene must have been a very curious one, and the whole affair not a little interesting. Poundmaker and some of his chief men are put under arrest. The others are sent off to their reserve, and all stolen property is ordered to be given up. All day long, the Indians continue to come in, bringing with them many rifles, ponies, wagons, and other spoils. They look most unlovingly at us as they pass, and evidently are not at all pleased at the present phase of affairs. Poundmaker's surrender comes on the heels of the Métis defeat at Batash, and after that main Métis force is beaten in battle, defeated, there's not much hope for the, the Cree to continue the fight and so Poundmaker surrenders. Big Bear, he lasts a few more weeks but he, he too will surrender later that summer. Lou Riel is eventually put on trial. He doesn't escape to America this time. They catch him. and He's put on trial and eventually executed. Hung by the neck until dead. Poundmaker and Chief Big Bear, they too won't last long. They will die as a result of their captivity, thus concluding the last of the great North American Indian Wars. Castles is going to write a little bit more about his time on the prairie, but, but I think what I'm going to do is go right to his last entry, dated Thursday, 23rd July. So they take the train back first back through Winnipeg and then through Ontario, going through Owen Sound and then all the way back to Union Station in Toronto. And along the way, this train is stopping at the small towns and cities and the citizens are flocking to the train with handkerchiefs and flowers and lemonade and baked goods. He writes that the men are rather flirtatious with some of the daughters and young women of the hamlets and towns they pass by. Here's the last entry. We have a delightful run from Owen Sound, greeted with cheers at every station nay, even at every crossroad. With hearts light and thankful, we see once more the far-off smoke of our beloved Toronto, and as our eyes fill fast at the roar of welcome that meets us, our labors, our trials, our dangers, our hardships are all forgotten, and gratitude and enthusiasm alone remain. This is not an anti-war diary, far from it. Castles, a lot of these Canadians, they seem to enjoy this imperial adventure called war. And they were the victors. And since 1885, there has not been a battle on Canadian territory. Thank God. But history moves on and history is never over. That concludes this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked what you heard today, I would encourage you to listen to episode four 
where I look at what Louis Riel and the Métis could have done to win this thing. If you like the podcast, please do me a favor, like, share, review, and rate the podcast wherever you download it from. Tell your friends and family about it. And until next time, out.